Hey everyone, uh, we're gonna get started in just a second. All right, welcome everyone to NYC++. My name is Daniel Katz. I'm a senior software engineer over at Bloomberg and one of the lead organizers of this meetup. Um, many of you I know have joined us before. Maybe even you were with us uh, last week for our meetup over at Adobe. Um, but some of you are also joining us for the first time. Uh, so for those who are, welcome. And um, you know, this meetup is open to the public, to anyone who has some enthusiasm for C++. Um, so whether you're a university student right now, whether you're a graduate of a boot camp program, maybe you've been writing C++ longer than I've been walking, or um, you know, maybe you're just thinking about learning to code. Hopefully there's a space for all of those people um, at this meetup. So welcome and thanks for deciding to spend uh, your evening with us. So with that said, uh, tonight we're, uh, well, before we jump into tonight's talk, there's a few companies that I need to be thanking. Um, First of all, not that, that. <laughs> uh, Bloomberg Engineering, silver level sponsor for NYC++. Thank you so much uh, for your generous uh, investment in New York C++ community. Uh, Bloomberg sponsorships really been instrumental to uh, making us able to hold these meetups month after month. This is actually our 11th meetup that we've now held, which to me is crazy. Uh, and our first one was actually uh, just about a year ago. It was November 17th, 2022. David Senkel over at Adobe. He was our first speaker for NYC++. I know some of you were there. Uh, and we've had a lot of awesome events since. So um, yeah, Bloomberg, thank you for helping us to keep this going. Also, bronze sponsorship new last month, uh, Monochrome Search. Uh, they're a uh, talent search firm with many clients in New York City that hire C++ engineers. Uh, so Monochrome, thank you so much for your support of our meetup. Uh, special for tonight, Undo is sponsoring the uh, food for tonight's event. So if you enjoyed the pizza and the salad and such, you have Undo to thank. Uh, Undo, thank you so much for uh, supporting NYC++. Yeah, let's have a round of applause for Undo. <clears throat> All right, and last but not least, MongoDB, thanks so much for hosting us here tonight. Uh, this is actually the third event that MongoDB has uh, had us here for. They had us here in March when we heard Sean Baxter speak, and also back here in June for Titus Winters. So, uh, you know, it's companies like MongoDB that invite us into their offices that give us a place to meet for the meetup, so it seems like kind of a non-starter without that. So, MongoDB, thanks again so much for having us. And... Um, so tonight we're going to be hearing from Dr. Greg Law, who is the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Undo. And uh, Greg's going to be talking to us all about debugging. Their company creates a product called a time traveling debugger. And if you don't know what that is, we're going to learn that and more. Uh, I'm sure that all of us can learn a little bit more about how to use debugging tools more effectively, but uh, especially if you're like me and your primary debugging method is to stare very hard at the code until you understand why it's wrong, uh, at least one of the reasons why it's wrong, uh, then you especially have a lot to learn. So with that said, uh, please join, uh, join me in welcoming from the UK, uh, Dr. Greg Law to NYC++. Thank you. I've got the, uh, I got the yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah, thanks, Dan. Hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. And the first thing I'm going to say, congratulations to all of you for living in this city. I love, uh, I love this place. It's so cool. Although I don't think I, had to, I, don't think I could live here. It's, I'm just too lazy. Um, right. OK, yeah, so first off, you may have seen uh, the little teaser of this, of this slide. Oh, I'm going upside down. Hang on. All right. Yeah, so debugging not like maybe always thought of as the most glamorous thing, but I reckon most programmers spend most of their time debugging. Right? Like I immodestly think of myself as an okay programmer. How many, and I think about how many lines of code can I write and have it work first time, unless it's like super trivial, like, you know, actual code, five, ten, maybe. How many lines of code can I change and have it work first time? I reckon that number 
is less than one, right, on average. Just, it just never works, never works first time. And so by debug, just to set the context, by debugging, I don't mean like that, that real kind of outer loop end of the journey debugging where something gets you know, reported in production, you, know, you think the code is perfect and you've shipped it and it's, and it's in production and now someone reports something, it could be just I've typed it in and it didn't do what I wanted first time around. All right, so this chat puts it much better than I ever could. So Brian Kernigan, one of the inventors of C and Unix, says that everyone knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. So if you're as clever as you can be when you write it, how will you ever debug it? You might know that quote, it's quite a famous quote. Um, and I think really what he's saying here is keep it simple, right? Give yourself margin for error. But I think there's an interesting kind of corollary of this. If this is true, which I think it is, it means that debuggability is like the limiting factor in how good your code can be, right? Like whatever metric you have for how good your code is, whether it's how fast it runs, how quickly you can write it, whether it's uh, you know, how maintainable it is, how small it is, whatever the metric for good is, if you can be twice as good at debugging it, then you can make the code twice as good. All right, so how do we debug? Maybe we use the dynamic checkers. We'll see examples of all of these in the talk. Uh, maybe we use the good old fashioned debugger. We'll see plenty of that. It's dynamic logging and, and lots of fancy stuff out there. Or maybe, as Dan said at the beginning, we just think really hard, right? Stare at the code a really long time and just deduce what, what's going on. Or maybe we just add loads of printfs, right? Until eventually the answer becomes clear. And why is that? Well, partly you've probably seen this old XKCD cartoon. Programmers slacking off, they're compiling. Why is it compiling? because they just added a printf, right? And now they need to recompile. And there is a kind of, just a, I mean, a laziness, I think, to this, right? There's just a kind of, you kind of get into that Zen state, you just add another printf, run again. You don't have to think too hard. It's like, it's the programmer's equivalent of just going through your email. It's kind of make work. Um, and it's kind of, it's our happy place. If we've been, write, if we've been writing code for, you know, well, however long, you've said maybe just started, maybe been writing code for 20, 30 years, you've been adding printfs to debug it for 20, 30 years. So it's very automatic. It's very system one, if you know the system one, system two, thinking fast and slow kind of uh, uh, way of talking about, you know, how we think and work. So it's kind of easy. Um, but there is, uh, before I get onto that, um, there is a, definitely a place for printf debugging, right? So this is not, I'm, actually this, it's become quite, there's been a lot of like Twitter, spats and things uh, over the last few years have become uh, like whether debuggers are good or evil or whether you should always use printf. And it's like, they're just different tools, right? And you use different tools for different kinds of problem. And part of being good at debugging is working out what the right tool for the job is. And, you know, print statements or logging or however you do it, they do give you something that other tools don't give you and they definitely have a place. But I reckon people rely on it far too much. So, I'm going to go through, um, I actually didn't do a time check. This talk should last about an hour. Is that right? Yeah, good. Okay, phew, I should check that. Right, so, uh, we're gonna, so I've got some, uh, some kind of general advice, and then we're going to look at some of the tools that are there available for you to use. It's very Linux-centric. I'm assuming most people these days writing C++ writing on Linux. I know that other, other operating systems, a lot of these tools and things will still apply, but like how you actually use them obviously will differ depending on the platform. But let's um, actually let's start with part zero because we're C plus plus programmers, so that's how we count. Uh, and what do we mean by debugging, right? What is that? Or what is that process of debugging? I mean, we all know what it is, but let's just think a bit about what we're, what we're trying to do here. If we write the code, or we inherit the code, or whatever, and we have certain expectations about what that code is going to do, how it's going to run, and reality diverges from our expectations, right? Um, and the job of debugging is to figure out where is that point of divergence? Where did, re where did reality diverge from what I was expecting? Okay, uh, usually does something a bit more like that, but the way we, and that is a, that's a really, well, that's a really hard problem, right? And modern computers run billions of operations every second, even if it's just, you know, that per, per thread, per core, per process, huge complexity and trying to work out where reality diverged from your expectations is super hard. And so what we have to do is, we're usually go through this process of gathering more and more clues. That's why we, you know, whether we're adding a printf and running again, or whether we're, you know, just, whatever we're doing to just get clues about what is actually happening and try and 
almost kind of binary chop the problem to some degree and home in on where is that point of divergence. And, uh, and so as we do that, we're kind of building these clues of what's going on. We're building this, this jigsaw puzzle piece by piece until eventually we understand enough about the system. Usually there's some like bad assumption that we've made, but uh, could, you know, could, be, could be anything we're getting at the moment. And you're building these clues, so it's kind of, yeah, this, or, you know, think of it as a detective story. What's the thing some people say? It's that you're a detective in, the, in a crime that you committed. Um, although maybe you didn't commit the crime. I mean, often we're actually finding bugs in existing code that we've inherited. Um, and I think two things really make bugs hard to fix, to determine how hard they are. You know, some are easy, some you can just fix straight away, and some take, well, uh, just last week, I heard from uh, somebody who uh, they had a bug they were trying to fix for 10 years. Now, not like all the time, not consistently, right? They gave up and then they came back and they tried again and they finally fixed it last week with the help of our stuff, I'll just say, but, but uh, with, with the help of the undo time traveling uh, magic. But that's but, yeah, point. sometimes they're easy, sometimes they're super hard. And what makes them hard, I think there's two things. How long is it but between like that divergence of reality and you noticing? Right? If, it, if it's really quick, like, I don't know, I forgot to check a pointer for null and then I dereference it, it's kind of the problem is right where the symptoms are, so that's generally quite easy to debug. But if it's uh, a, a much longer time, the longer it is, the harder it gets. And that's why um, bad results are always the worst kind of bug to diagnose because it could have been like hours or days even. And, uh, and, and it's why assertions are really good. What assertions do is narrow that window, right? They mean you notice much closer to the point of divergence. The other thing I think that makes bugs hard is how like deterministic are they, right? Does it always fail in the same way or does it fail in a different way each time or does it only fail one time in a thousand or whatever? And if it fails in a different way every time, obviously every time I get a new clue, the, sh the world is kind of, the, the sand is shifting underneath my feet and uh, it becomes like super hard to build up that picture of, of what's going on. And when things are kind of in the top right hand corner here, they're both very non-deterministic and there's a long time between the bug and its failure. That's when you have like those 10 year, those 10 year bugs, right? Um, and uh, maybe right fully up here in the, in the right hand corner, we have the Heisen bugs, right? So you know this, you add your printf, usually it's adding a printf, but it could be anything. You add your printf, you change the timings, change and and uh, and the bug just kind of goes away all right let's go a little bit interactive so different kinds of bugs uh and i think these are kind of some of the most so logic errors i mean every bug in some sense is a logic error but you know you, you, that's your you know uh, you, you you have a, a less than equals rather than you should have had a less than or something right you've got a logic error um pointer errors i mean you know, there's things we can do with smart pointers and everything that makes those less common, but they're still totally a thing. Error handling is a really common one, I think, right? So people have error handling code, but the error handling code itself isn't quite right. And it tends not to be tested and it can give very weird uh, effects. Race conditions, we'll quite some of those in a bit. Uh, undefined behavior, as this is a C++ uh, conference that's uh, a meetup. Um, and uh, bad interface assumptions, I think, as well, is another common one, right? So there's an interface with another piece of code, another module that you're working with, maybe it's an interface to the OS. You know, you don't realize that uh, read can return short if, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're not reading from a local file system, for example, and that, that, that assumption kind of trips you up. So uh, what I was going to get into, I'm, I'm sure I've missed some. So what, other, what kind of quite hard to categorize these things. Let's go a little bit interactive. Let's write some slides as we, as we go here. So like, what have I missed? Bug categories. Old library versions, yeah, yeah. Or oh, it's just general version mismatch, right. Yeah. <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> uh, let's do it like this. Hang on. I haven't done that very cleverly. Uh, okay. So bugs in libraries and other, another, all in the OS or compiler or whatever, right? I mean, it's never a compiler bug. It sometimes it's an OS bug, usually not, sometimes. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Type coercion or other 
you know what I'd say? Language weirdness. Let's give it a bit more general. Yeah, type mismatch. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So loads of different kinds of bugs, right? And um, I'm just going to, every time I give this talk now, we're gonna, I'm going to build that slide up. So uh, thank you for helping me. Thank you for doing my job for me. Uh, all right, so that was part zero. So part one, so it's getting some advice now. So uh, yeah, an assumption is something you don't realize you've made. Uh, or as uh, more colloquial known, more colloquially said, assumption is the mother of all fuck ups. Um, uh, so we're trying to, we're trying to look for, yeah, but assumption is something we don't know we've made. So we're trying to uh, tease out that assumption, right? And so this is obviously kind of an uh, uh, allusion to rubber duck debugging, right? This thing is like, like the story comes from, uh, I think it was a, a professor teaching programming in the lab and the students would always say, I'm completely stuck. I've been working on this problem for hours and I just can't figure it out. And the problem is when this happens and then, oh, now I written now suddenly the, it, just explaining the problem makes it clear because the, the, the student would uncover the assumption they didn't realize they'd made. And, uh, and in the end, the professor just put a rubber duck in the corner of the lab and said, explain the problem to the duck. And then only then, if the, if the, if, the uh, if it's not clear, you can come and ask. You can come and ask ask me. So you can just um, like try and figure everything out, right? And maybe not like this. Hopefully not quite like this, but maybe more like I think just writing it down. Just writing down what you're seeing is a really useful process. And I think with pen and paper rather than typing it, I think that's because most of us can type a lot faster than we can write. And so as you write enforced slowly it really makes you think about what you're saying and so quite often you write down you know like well there's absolutely no way what i'm seeing can be true because this thing will never be zero and this would oh actually maybe it could be zero right and and it just helps to, to tease out those assumptions so that i find is a good uh, good good technique but uh, related actually i was going to put a slide in for this is like going for a walk right? stop thinking about the problem for a bit i think we've all been there working all day trying to fix something and I've, I've literally had, before I've left the building, the answer has presented itself when I've been like bashing my head against the desk for all, all afternoon. Or maybe it's in the shower the next morning or something, right? So yeah, sometimes just stop thinking about it. The other piece of general, this is, yeah. So when you, if you smell smoke, right? If you're in your home or your office or something and you smell smoke, you're gonna go and try and figure out what's going on, right? You're gonna look for the source of that smell of smoke rather than just hope it goes away hopefully. Uh, and uh, very often, I think, when you're debugging, you find something that doesn't seem right. Like, oh, that's not, you know, you uncover something that looks like an invariant isn't holding or something. That, and I reckon about half the time, what feels like a tangent, unrelated to the actual bug I'm hunting down, turns out to be relevant. Right, so allow yourself to get sidetracked. And even if it's not relevant to the bug you're hunting down, something is wrong, something's screwy somewhere. Maybe it, the, at the least it's your understanding of the system is broken, but probably the system is broken. So uh, you know, don't leave it to the next time. That's gonna blow up some other time in the future and you're already halfway there because you've already seen this weirdness, right? So, 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 so I definitely recommend doing kind of a, uh, a depth first, Kind of search of the spill, breadth first, I guess. Search the space, right? When you when you see something that's not quite right, keep keep going to find out what's the root cause of that, and you'll probably it'll probably actually help you in your immediate job anyway. Yeah, just add lots and lots of assertions, right? Um, there's a big kind of debate about whether assertions should be fatal in production or not, and then different people have different opinions. I've kind of changed my mind on this in the last few years. I used to think they shouldn't be. Fatal because I have this theory that about 50% of assertions that fire fire because the assertion itself is wrong, not because the thing it's asserting is bad, right? The assertion itself is a bad assumption. So like why bring down production because the assertion is wrong? But I kind of changed my mind on that. I think um, then you need to fix the assertion, right? And, and you just need not to be ignoring it. Um, so uh, yeah. And then the other thing, um, 
what I've kind of changed my mind in the last few years is uh, yeah, test or panic, right? So if if uh, there's an error condition, an error case, like, I don't know, that read from the file system returns an error. Right? Everyone knows every read from the file system may potentially return an error, so I need to handle the error case, right? Well, fine, if you've got a test for it, right? If you're somehow able to, like, do fault injection and test the, test the, test the error handling case, great, do that. But if you don't, I, so I often hear people say, well, it's just, that's really hard to test, and, you know, we're just going to, like, do our best to handle the error. Like, it will be wrong, right? Or at least, if it's not wrong now, it will become wrong in the future if someone changes some code around it and the call site changes and something, right? So you, you need to have test cases for your error handling or just panic, you know, abort. At the, at the, if, the read, if the read from the file system returns an error, just abort. And then what you're doing is bringing the point where you notice the badness much closer to where the bad thing is, right? And then finally, this is kind of a nice little segue, is to use the tools. There's a lot more out there than, than just printf. So let's get into some of the tools, so many tools. Um, so we'll talk about GDB, LLDB. we we'll talk about uh, Valgrind and the sanitizers. Uh, yeah, S-Trace and L-Trace are very cool. Lib C++ debug mode. And then obviously close to my heart, because that's what I spent the last like 10 years of my life working on, is, uh, is time travel as a kind of different way of debugging, different way of using, or a different kind of debugger, I suppose. All right, so GDB. I'm going to just do like a, a, a poll. So put your hand up and keep it up if you ever use GDB. Like who ever uses GDB? Okay, so that's pretty much everyone, right? Keep it up. But now, but now only keep your hand up if you've used GDB in the last like month. Who's used it in the last month? Okay, so now we're like down, so it's everybody uses it sometimes, but, and then last week, today, right, so it's, yeah, it's, so you get this kind of, but generally I think what do you see, there's some people today, excellent, well, I mean, well, it's not excellent, I'm sorry, you had to, it's never a good thing, right, but, uh, 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 yeah, people use GDB or whatever their debugger of choice is quite rarely, I think most people use it like a few times a year despite the fact that most programmers spend most of their time debugging, right? And, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of a shame. So, um, it's really rich. It's not very discoverable. Uh, the documentation's not bad. It's not perfect. Um, but uh, uh, if the documentation's not bad if you know what to look for, right? But a lot of times people just don't know what's there. They don't know the richness that is available. Um, so let me just do, let's just do a couple of like super short demos. One other thing, I think this is becoming more known now, perhaps partly because of my own kind of campaign, but Timmy mode still, I think, gets the, gets, wins the prize for the least well-known, most useful thing that's like least well-known you know, least well known and most useful. So I don't know, let's like take just a really simple uh, little program. Oh, if you do dash G3, that gives a little bit more compiler information again. Let, Sometimes GDB do a better job. Let's, and we load that into GDB. And oh, let's make that screen, hang on a minute, maybe, so we can see all of the lines. Uh, yeah, so let's start. So start, it just puts a temporary breakpoint on main and runs. So here we are. So there's multiple ways of getting into TUI mode. Um, control XA, for some reason. Um, is, is one, so there you go. So now, we, now we're in this two mode, text user interface mode, and it's obviously still very 1980s, but I can, it's so much better, I can see the context. And the thing I quite like about it, um, there's a number of things that I like about it. Uh, one is that I can still type at the command line, most of the IDEs that you use, like take this kind of like philosophical decision to take away the command line, you're supposed to like click buttons or at least use the shortcut keys and command line is really useful and can be once you know what you're doing is faster so so it, it, it keeps that here and I can so I can just do everything um, but I and I can see I can see the uh, the context I don't have to you know, it just makes it much easier to get in my mind what is what is going on you can you can it's quite configurable so you can go win height for example win height command let's make the command window a little bit shorter there we go see a bit more context 
Um, we can go control. Oh, control XA is not that easy to remember. So there's also just two, you can go to e disable, to e enable is probably the easiest uh, one. You can also go layout. So if I go to e disable again, and I can go layout SRC. See, not very intuitive, not very discoverable, but once you use it, very useful. One of the annoying things about two emo people often complain about, and I hated for ages until I figured out what to do about it, is uh, I've got the command line, I've got the CLI, and we all use up arrow on the CLI to go through the command history, right? And when you do that, when I go up arrow in two mode, it just like moves and right and left. So that's annoying, but that's okay because we can just go con what we're supposed to do. You're not really supposed to use up arrow and down when I'm supposed to, but anyway, control P for previous and N for next. I can go through command, command history and B and F to go backwards and forwards and A to go to the beginning and E to go. So I can use the control uh, commands to move around and that just works. Or if I really want to be using those arrow keys, I can set the focus. So if I focus, so there's the command window and the source window, focus command, and now I can up arrow and down arrow and that works as well. I kind of think that ought to be the default really, but anyway. Um, uh, yeah, we can also look at more than that. So I can go control X2, and uh, now I'm looking at uh, the assembly code and go control X2 again. And now I get three windows, including my source code and my, and my disassembly, which in order to demonstrate to yourself that it's not actually a compiler bug can be useful. Um, that's TUI mode. What else have we got to talk about? Python, so Python integration. So you can make your own TUI windows with the, 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 Py, the Python integration on modern GDBs is really good actually. and it, pretty much exposes everything. So I can create, so I can type, I can just type Python at it, right? So, and then this is just normal. So go import OS and then print uh, I am PID. Uh, well, I expect we can go, I haven't actually tried this, but this should work. Uh, and, uh, oh yeah, don't, got to go like that, don't we? Uh, and you can you can just do it on one line if you want, right? So, um, but but the Python integration has got you can it's just this GDB module. And I can do basically anything that I can do in GDB now. I can do through the Python. So I can create breakpoints, interrogate those breakpoints. I can look at data. Um, one of the cool things is I can uh, I can make uh, pretty printers, right? Anyone use anyone written their own pretty printer or used pretty printers? Yeah, used. Yeah, useful. Yeah, like. That's a, I, this is a really good investment of time writing a pretty printer. It's a little bit painful. It's a little bit baroque, but you know, it's like more. It feels like just more lines of code than I think it could be. But um, it's okay. You can just go on the manual page and you just copy paste the standard examples, and you can make your own pretty printers. And like honestly, your future self will thank you for it. It's a really good uh, uh, a use of time, just to make it so much easier to see what's going on in your code. And there's a bunch that come as standard. So if I just do a few more lines and build up this vector a bit, and now I look at the vector, it tells me in nice kind of English what the vector is. Um, uh, as lo it's now it's the pretty printers are some Python code that comes with your distro. And uh, so they should, I mean, unless you, unless you like doing weird things and upgrading packages and stuff, if you're just doing normal stuff on the distro, the pretty printers that are installed on your system will match the library version, the standard library version, right? So it all it all should, should work because obviously the, the way the data is re represented changes as the library versions evolve. But uh, yeah, the pretty printers should be updated with them. Uh, one just word of advice, what well, was a word of caution on this though, that the there's a Python interpreter built into GDB, and then it's calling out to the pretty printers, which are Python modules on your system, and that can have a version mismatch, right? So if I copy the GDB binary, if I use like Red Hat's GDB on a Debian system, or even a slightly older version, Red Hat 7 version built GDB on a Red Hat 8 system, then uh, the pretty printers tend to stop working in really non-obvious ways. It doesn't tell you there's a problem, it just, they just like stop doing anything. Um, you can, um, uh, you can disable them somehow. Um, well, now how do you do that? Can anyone remember how to disable pretty printers? Is it? No, there, I was going to show you what it looks like when it's not working. Um, 
Anyway, yeah, so you've got all this Python integration, and if you can, basically if you can think it, you can do it, you can script it in the Python, super useful. Um, there is also an older inbuilt GDB scripting language, which can be kind of more convenient in a way, but um, probably you want to do it in the Python for the most part. You can load up core files, you can attach to a running program, you probably know all of this. Uh, GDB dashboard is quite cool. Anyone use GDB dashboard? Kind of, uh, it's just basically a GDB init file. So it's on GitHub, you can go and download it. And uh, let's see if I've got one here. I think I have actually. Uh, so, is it GDB dashboard? Uh, oh, I'm in 2E mode, so that's going to just confuse it. 2E disable. Uh, let's do that again. Oh, I don't know, I've done it twice now. Yeah, there we go. So that's GDP dashboard. So it's kind of like 2E mode, but different. It's got more stuff. Um, very configurable. Um, it tells me my threads and my stack and everything. Um, dynamic printf is quite cool. Anyone use dynamic printf? So uh, obviously the big problem with print, but printf is good, right? It's got a place in the world, definitely for giving you a story of what the program has done. Um, obviously one of the bad things about it, unless you want to just goof off doing saw fights, is you have to recompile. You can, uh, with, dy with dynamic or dprintf, you kind of put a breakpoint and then you put a print string. So uh, <clears throat> let's, um, I don't actually know how to turn GDB dashboard off, so I'm going to start again. Uh, uh, so um, yeah, so like, Goes to print, you give it a line number, just normal sort of breakpoint syntax. Oh, and I think you have to go, it's a bit of a weird syntax. You have to just do it with comma separated. So it's a one kind of argument, um, but vector push. And then you can give like that, I think. So that's put a dynamic printf there. And so if I now continue my program to the end, uh, oh, I didn't put new line on, but you can see what it's, what it, what it's done. So that's quite cool. Um, uh, loads of front ends, right? So VS Code obviously is very popular now. Uh, uh, C Lion, Eclipse. Uh, it's the DDD is like super old and not really maintained anymore, which is a shame because it gives you something that, as far as I know, no other debugger gives you, which is this ability to like plot the data. You can draw out the data and you can draw your lists and things. Um, so it's kind of nice. And it'd be nice if some of the more maintained IDEs uh, inherited that stuff, I think. Um, you can use it within Emacs, and I think that totally does make it an IDE at that point if you use the Emacs integration. Or if you're a VI person, you can use Vim Spectre. Um, uh, yeah, loads and loads of different, loads and loads of front ends for it. Um, anyone use, who uses VS Code? That's a front to like, not to edit your code, but to actually, actually drive the debugger. Just one, one and a half. Like, but sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, C-Line, quite a few. Eclipse is, I know we've got one Eclipse fan at least. Uh, yeah, it's a code, <laughs> but, but not running it, not using the debugger. No, yeah. Really uh, much better answer, of course you do. Good chap. Uh, all right, so, um, just before we get into uh, some of these other things, I just want to run through, yeah, some of the some of the GDB myths. Some of these are more general dynamic, uh, debugger myths. Right, one myth is that it's going to change my... Running a program in GDB changes the way the program runs. Uh, and um, you're not going to... Don't bother to read all of this, but this is some stuff on the internet that says that if you run your program in GDB, then the system call may return prematurely because, like, and with um, e intro and stuff. Like, that's not true and hasn't been true for years. It was in really early versions of GDB and, and Linux, but it hasn't been true for a very long time. Sadly, this is actually in the still current GDB documentation. So, yeah, the documentation is not perfect. Some of it's out of date. I think it probably is, it may well be true on some operating systems, but in practice, everyone's using Linux, and everyone's using a Linux that's like at least, you know, in the last 10 years, and this just is not an issue. Your program will run. Like exactly the same. It might possibly change the timings a little bit, but not too much. Like it'll take if your live dynamic library loads will slow down and things as the debugger gets involved. But unless your program is like loading a library dynamically or hitting a breakpoint that you've set, then uh, it's going to run exactly the same when the when the debugger is attached. Right? It, it really very. I mean, yeah, hardly any difference at all. Um, to all intents and purposes. Uh, 
people often get confused between, well, nearly everyone has a debug build and a release build, right? And it's just a binary choice of one or the other. And debug build has all of the debug stuff in, loads of like extra assertion checking stuff, and it runs dash O zero and like everything. And then there's the optimized build, which has nothing and is like super optimized. And, right? and it, these things are completely orthogonal. And right? you can have totally optimized code with dash G or dash G3. And the debug level, sometimes people aren't, aren't clear on this, but like the debug level will not change the generated code at all. And all it does is add these extra debug info sections. And like they, they live on disk. They're not even going to get loaded into your program when you're running it unless until you attach the debugger. OK, and that can make the outputs big. On, on things like Firefox with debug info, the debug info is uh, something like 80% of the resulting binary size or something like that. Um, you can do split dwarf and other things to, to, to manage that. Um, <sighs> like, do plows and tractors make farmers lazy? I, know, I mean, I hear this a lot. I don't understand it. Right? Just, just use the use the tools. I think there's a kind of there's a kind of weird machismo to it. I think actually, um, yeah. I, I just I don't, I don't know. Less said, the less said, the better about that nonsense statement. GDB doesn't work well with threads. I don't know what that's about. People say that a lot. Seems to work fine for me. Maybe I'll put it out to the audience. I mean, what's like? I hear this a lot, but but where? Can, can, like this is. I'm not being. This is not a rhetorical question. Is there anybody found that that GDB doesn't work with threaded programs? I mean, it's hard to debug threaded programs, right? But that's not the GDB's fault. That's the threads' fault. Works pretty well as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it has a difficult UI. Well, actually, I don't, I don't think that's, I, 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 like it does, like the UI is inconsistent in places, um, but so is everything, right? I mean, if you try to. <laughs> yeah, right, you can actually fix that. There's a, you can have a TTY thing, so yeah, that's annoying. Yeah, that's annoying, and and um, and and sometimes like like my favorite is there's a neat command called R break, which is regular expression breakpoint. So you just put regular, and every function that matches that regex will have a breakpoint on it. Um, and there's another thing called R watch, which for read only watch point. Like you know, that's but but that's like every piece of software has these weirdnesses, right? And if you're looking for inconsistencies in the U, I mean, has anyone tried Git? <laughs> So actually, I think the UI is reasonably well thought through, fairly consistent. It's not discoverable. It's lousy at, at discoverability, definitely. All right. Who uses LLDB? One. One hand. Just one? Oh, two. Three. OK. Yeah. I, I, no, no, one, no one seems to type LLDB. It gets used by a few front ends of the most um, Xcode being uh, the biggest one, I think. But um, uh, it's basically the same, right, as GDB, except it's a bit different. And in some ways, it's worse. And in some ways, it's better. Uh, there are people who feel very strongly about this. I'm not really one of them. Um, but let's have a look at it. So let's run that same thing in LLDB. Uh, why did that happen? <laughs> it's a live demo. Yeah, it's a live demo. Uh, is that okay? I think that's actually working. I don't. Uh, I don't know what that error is. Anyway, so I can put a breakpoint, and I can run it. It kind of looks like GDB mostly, and I can even go. It doesn't have two e text user interface. It has GUI. Uh, yeah, right. Look, it's the same. Uh, maybe it's a bit nicer actually, but it still doesn't. But it's my pet peeve. It doesn't have the command line. So um, you have to kind of switch in and out of it to, to do anything of, uh, meaningfully. But um, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's escape to come out of that. So that's LLDB. There's a sort of philosophical difference that, uh, like in theory, it makes it better, which is obviously the compiler is taking source code and turning it into machine code, and the debugger takes machine code and turns it back into source code, effectively, by reading the debug info that the compiler outputs. 
and um, they're like totally separate projects, GDB and GCC, right, or Clang, or however you're compiling. And uh, they do a pretty good job considering, like, keeping things in sync, but, it's, but the LLVM approaches, it's all, you know, kind of modularized, and it's the same code, the same modules that's converting, you know, that's, like, generating the debug info is reading the debug info, rather than, like, separate projects. So this is a, probably a better way to structure things, but it just doesn't have the same despite Apple putting quite a bit into it, it still doesn't have the same kind of love and attention as GDB has. So I think in practice, it's just, it's just, it's struggling to keep up. But it does have like Python integration and attach and remote and all kinds of, all the good stuff. Okay, let's go, let's go from debuggers for a moment. So Valgrind um, is, uh, it's kind of being a little bit supplanted by the sanitizers that we'll look at in a minute, but it's still, they're different, they're, they're good at different things. Uh, who uses Valgrind ever? Oh, right, okay, everyone, pretty much. Um, yeah, so it's actually a suite of tools. So if you just type Valgrind, then you get memcheck. Who use, who's used any of these other, Helgrind or Cashgrind or, okay, way fewer, interesting. Um, yeah, so let's just quickly see what that looks like. Uh, so here is a program, uh, oh, actually, uh, from the last time I gave this talk, let's put this back again. So uh, it's going to malloc some memory and write past the end of it, which like clearly is bad. Uh, GCC minus G buffer, and then I run that in Valgrind. And yeah, look, it says... Uh, Invalid, yeah, top here, invalid write of size one at this address, at this line of code. Super helpful, right? Um, uh, and it gives me information about leaks as well. Um, and I don't have to recompile my code, which is cool, right? I just run it. Um, and maybe I can't recompile the code. Maybe I'm running someone else's code, right? Um, uh, if I can, if it's convenient to, re to recompile the code, then I think address sanitizer probably is going to be preferable in most circumstances. Uh, who uses address sanitizer? Or any of the sanitizers? Okay, fewer hands and Valgrind. That's interesting. Wasn't expecting that. Um, so let's do the same thing. It was originally with Clang, but it's now in GCC as well. So I go dash F sanitizer. It's basically a compiler feature. Um, and it looks mighty similar, maybe slightly easier to read, and a bit more information there, and color coding and stuff. But basically, uh, oh, no, I didn't do dash G. That was silly. So it, did, it couldn't give me line information because I didn't ask for it. But notice I just run the program as normal because it, it's, it's essentially this, uh, uh, this uh, compiler feature. And yeah, look, here we are in the middle here. Look, Buffer dot C line seven, um, so we can just go and fix that. Um, so it's much faster. So Valgrind so is like really quite slow, like maybe hundred x slow down, um, and sanitizers will work. It all depends, but maybe half speed, um, and uh, it can also do more stuff. So let's go back to my really simple program. Let's put this back to what it was before. So now I've had to, I had to put these these paddings in because otherwise I get I would um, get stack corruption and ruin the return. But but so you can ignore the pad things. But I've got this uh, array on the heap on the uh, on the stack of uh, ten elements, and I'm writing past the end of the array. So if I compile that and I run that in Valgrind, it says all good. Right, Valgrind doesn't know that because it doesn't see the. Uh, now, I think it. I think in theory it could read the debug info and figure some of that stuff out, but it doesn't. But if I do that with address sanitizer, mm -hmm. uh, and I could spell. Look, it's found it. So it'll actually find more stuff. Um, because it's a compiler feature, and the compiler knows about the, you know, array on the stack and like how big that should be. Um, 
Cool. So there's loads of sanitizers, actually, not just the dress sanitizer. Just like there's loads of uh, Valgrin tools, there's loads of sanitizers. Uh, the biggies, I think, are a dress sanitizer, thread sanitizer. It's memory. I've just realized I don't know what memory sanitizer does. Is that is it uninitialized? It's uninitialized, yeah, yeah. But you have to recompile everything to the library. Uh, oh, really? You have to recompile the library to it as well? Okay. That I didn't know. Uh, cool, there you go. Uh, so, yeah, just like Valgrind is a suite of tools. And um, actually, there's loads of sanitizers. But actually, uh, and there isn't, you can't say F sanitize equals all because some of these things are mutually incompatible. Um, but you can say sanitize equals undefined, and that gives you like most of the ones that you want. So actually, I think the undefined behavior sanitizer is nine times out of ten, that's what you want. It'll give you more, it'll catch more stuff, um, including things like. Uh, you know, array overruns and things which are undefined. Uh, by setting environment variables, you can have your uh, C++ libraries uh, run in debug mode with more checking and things, um, uh, different levels depending on what you're doing, uh, which ones you're using. Um, they're kind of all or nothing, right? It's just an uh, environment variable that you set. If you want a bit more fine-grained control with the GNU libraries, you have these debug versions of the containers, um, which will do range checking and things. So you can like choose to use those, um, you know, choose which type to use. Uh, so you can kind of turn these things on and off a bit more, a bit more uh, control. Um, S trace and L trace. So th these are very, very useful. Actually, they're often used. Often used. Most useful. S trace is good when it's just some. I'm not trying to debug something. I'm trying to work out. Well, I'm not trying to debug a piece of code. I'm trying to work out why the program I'm trying to run doesn't do what I want. Usually because the error handling is bad. Reference to earlier comment. And uh, it, it really the problem was it wasn't able to open a file or something, but the error handling was messed up and it didn't tell me that at the time. Uh, so you can run S trace on it. And uh, I'm sure everyone has done like some of this. So I can run, I don't know, let's, let's uh, Let's run S trace on GCC now. That doesn't do very much actually because GCC is just a thin wrapper. Then it kicks off the preprocessor and then the actual compiler and stuff. So what I probably want is S trace minus F for follow fork. And then you see there's a lot more stuff. And I get the PIDs here as well. So all of the child processes are traced as well. Um, so I get to see what's actually happening. A nice little thing is dash K, uh, which gives me stack trace. So that's going to take for ages, but like every so, every, so it's, it gives me the system call, um, and it gives me the stack trace that invokes that system call, which is kind of useful. And that will uh, it's actually required that all uh, x86 64 binaries have sufficient not debug info, but sufficient information to unwind the stack. So these tools will work um, even with you know optimized builds that don't have frame pointers and the like. Um, L trace is a similar thing for uh, libraries, but last time I tried to do a demo, I couldn't make it work, so I'm too scared. Um, right, time travel. So this is um, sort of yeah, close close to my heart, as I said. So uh, my company uh, Undo.io, we've been we've been sort of spending the last ten years trying to make this uh, work, uh, like you know, properly work at scale and everything. Um, we're not the only ones. I think it is really an idea whose time has come. Um, but it's basically the I see I would summarize it as the so the thing about debuggers, the reason that debuggers do actually suck a little bit is that when I'm debugging, I'm trying to figure out what happened, right? Past tense. And and most debuggers don't tell you what happened, they tell you what's happening. Right, I hit a breakpoint, tell me let's start my program right now. Okay, give me a backtrace, give me some clue. It's why backtrace was one of the most commonly used commands in the debugger, right? Because that gives me some clue about what happened, how did I get here, but it's a tiny sliver of information, right? There's just a few bits of information that backtrace compared to the billions and billions of things that my program has done. Um, so what I want is a, my debugger to tell me what happened, and I want to be able to go back in time and see previous states of the program. And so time travel debugger will give you 
complete visibility into everything that happened, right? Every single line of code that executed, you can go back to any line of code and you can see full program state for every single line. And so there's really like nothing about your program execution that you can't just go and see. I used this, I was the HG Wells, the time machine uh, um, movie rather than something a bit more modern, uh, partly because I just think it's kind of cool, but uh, also it's a more realistic thing about what we mean, it describes what we mean by time travel. So most modern time travel uh, stories, people go back in time and change uh, history, right? Which obviously has like paradoxes and stuff. So we're not talking about that kind of time travel. It's more like H.G. Wells' time travel where he's an observer. He goes back and forward through time and he watches, he sees what's happening rather than changes what's happening. And it's been actually built into GDB for a number of years. Um, it's not really, it's kind of too slow to be very useful, but it does have some uses. Um, and it's good just to show you the, the, uh, the concept. And I'm gonna show you a few GDB tricks in this as well. So um, here's a bubble sort program, it just takes, get some uh, random data and then sorts the array. And uh, yeah, spoiler, uh, it has a bug. So I've already compiled it actually. So if I run, so it doesn't print any output, it just runs. But if I run this enough times, I say do that, eventually, eventually it will crash. Yay! <laughs> we'll be there, right? right? Like the, if I'm if I'm at home, you know, working something, working on something in the evening rather than like paying attention to my family, like I should do, and I might um, sometimes do a little, yeah, and someone in my family says, "Oh, did you make it work?" It's like, "No, no, I made it fail." <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so it's got a it's got a call dump here. So let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. What's, uh, there we go. So let's load that up into GDB, two, three. What's, okay, so let's look like the thing. Um, what do we do? Yeah, load a call file pretty much just like straight away. Type backtrace. And uh, yeah, not very, not very informative. Um, so let's do something uh, different. Let's run this in GDB. I'm going to use the GDB time travel it's called process record. Um, I'm going to I'm going to put a breakpoint on main. I'm going to put a break and I'm going to put some commands so you can hang commands off of a breakpoint. Um, so if I if I give a breakpoint number or if I don't give a breakpoint number, it's just the most recently created breakpoint. Uh, so my commands are main. I'm going to turn on record and I'm going to continue. There's the end of those commands. I'm going to put this is the flaky failure, right? Most of the time it works. I'm going to put another breakpoint on exit. And I'm going to hang some commands off of that, which is just to rerun the program. And then I'm going to set confirm off so it doesn't ask me every time and set pagination off because that kind of gets in the way. And so this is going to hit the main breakpoint, turn on recording, run to the end. If it gets to the end without crashing, it just starts again. And oh, that was nice and quick that time. Right, program stopped. It annoyingly doesn't tell me it stopped with the segv, but it did. Um, look at the backtrace. Right, that's all messed up again. Uh, so uh, what's going on? Well, we can look at the stack pointer because this kind of looks like stack corruption, right? So that's my stack pointer, um, but that doesn't tell me very much. Um, I need to know like what happened immediately before. So I can do this. I can do reverse step I, which is like step I, but backwards, right? So this is gonna go back one instruction. And oh look, we're back. Let's go into two mode so we can see a bit more what's going on. We're right at the return point, which you kind of expect because it looked like stack corruption, but now everything's like come to life. And so let's have a look at the stack pointer now. So this is x86, which is a fully descending stack. So what's at the stack pointer now should be, should be um, the return address. Uh, so if I, if we take a look at that, ah, long star star. SP. So that should be a return group, which kind of doesn't look much like an address, does it? And uh, I can examine memory of that address uh, like that. And yeah, that's not a legitimate address. So, uh, right. So I've got stack corruption. Who 
wrote into my stack, um, well, uh, why don't I just put a watch point, right? Now I could put a watch point on the top of the stack and then run backwards with the reverse continue, that should go to the line of code that corrupted the top of the stack. So uh, now with, this is gonna get a little bit um, down in the weeds, but with, uh, with GDB process record, unfortunately, watch points are a bit broken, which is really crummy because they're like the most useful feature really of time travel debugging. Fortunately, it's only hardware watch points that are broken and you can tell GDB not to use hardware watch points like that. And then it will use software watch points. Now software watch points totally suck. What they, they, they predate the ability of the hardware to have these kind of uh, hardware watch points. So what GDB will do is single step your program one instruction and then evaluate the expression that you're watching and see if it's changed and then single step another and then evaluate that. So it's like super slow. But I'm in GDB process record, which also does the same thing actually. It's single steps, sees what's happened, then it does another step, see what happens, and it does another step. So it doesn't actually matter. Everything already sucks. And so I can just turn off the, uh, the watch points. And so then, yeah, this is my stack pointer here. By the way, top tip, if you're in two mode, sometimes, um, if I'm trying to, I'm trying to select that, and uh, and and it doesn't select, but uh, shift uh, makes the mouse work again. So, uh, yeah. So I'm going to watch. I'm going to do location-based watch point, which is so like watch the address rather than. Actually, I don't need. I don't need to do location because I'm going to give it the address. But anyway, whatever. Uh, so put a watch point there, and now reverse continue. And ha ha, it's gone back to when that value in the stack got trashed. Print. I, 35th element in the array, what is uh, array, Just give me the type information, and it's an array of 32 words, and obviously I've got done the size of array, so it's modulo size of array in bytes. Now, that's, I like that little demo because it sort of brings together a bunch of things that you can do in GDB, um, but it's also a bit silly because uh, maybe I could do that uh, and uh, it immediately tells me that there's some uh, uh, some 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 memory corruption problems going on in my code, right? So it's a it's a it's an array overrun, so I can just run it through Valgrind or address sanitizer, and then give them the answer. So maybe it's not a great uh, example of of time travel debugging. Let's look at something. Um, let's look at something still very small, but um, uh, oh, where's now? I've got to find. That, just a second. Uh, no, actually, I changed my mind. I'm going to show you something a bit different, and then we'll wrap. So, um, uh, race conditions, right? Race conditions are horrible because they tend to be at the top right-hand corner of that thing I showed you earlier, right? It tends to be a long time between the problem and you noticing, and by the very definition, uh, they're non-deterministic. So I made here the, um, uh, the smallest race that I could think of. Um, and uh, so this program basically just spawns two threads that are both going to write into this result. And we don't know who's going to like win that race. Uh, so uh, I think I have to go standard equals C plus plus 20 race dot CPP. And I can run this now through uh, uh, Helgrind, uh, which is looking for data races, and uh, it, sure enough, it, it finds one. And basically, what it's able to see is that I've got this shared data between the two threads, and there's no locking or anything. And so that means, yeah. If I, so if I run this program, like just remind you what it looks like. Whoops. So if I run that, then uh, a dot out echo. Then, uh, so sometimes it's going to do. Oh, come on! Sometimes it will do zero. There we go. Sometimes it does zero. Sometimes it does one, depending on just like how the system feels and which thread gets to run first. So, how do we fix race conditions? Well, we just add. Uh, we just add um, mutex, right? Actually, I think I've got one already. To avoid me trying to type it all in live. Uh, so I'm just going to add a mutex and like pass that in and lock and unlock it. So if I do that, 
Uh, now I run that. Oops. Does it fix the race? Well, no, it doesn't fix the race. Because, actually, if you look again, the mutex didn't do anything. I've basically taken an atomic operation of a single assignment and wrapped it in a mutex to make the atomic thing still be atomic. But they're not atomic with respect to each other. Uh, let's run that through Halgrind again. He says everything's good, right? So it's, a, it's not the most sophisticated thing. And it's, and it, and it's why, actually, that wasn't that surprising that like lots of people have used the regular Balgrin, the memcheck, like pretty much everybody, and not that many people have used Helgrin because it's trying to find the canonical example of a race condition that you always get in like all the textbooks and you know CS101 or 201 or whatever is uh, there's an increment and a decrement and they're not protected by the mutex and and it's it's a specific kind of race condition. It's a data race and I reckon that's quite a small minority of race conditions. Most race conditions are not just the simple thing of, relatively simple thing of, I've got some data that multiple threads are accessing without properly locking. And frankly, just adding locks around my shared data is not that hard, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to get wrong, but it's just not that hard. Most race conditions are actually because uh, it's more like to do with the system. Like you've got some, you kick off some job and you wait one second for it to complete and it only takes like 10 milliseconds. So one second's plenty of time. But then one day, you know, the system's under a lot of load or something and turns out one second isn't quite enough. And, and it's that, like, or it's a signal comes in at an inopportune time and causes that thing once in a million times to return e intro or something. And that's, that's what's what most race conditions are like. And, and these tools don't kind of help you find that. Um, but the debugger can be good at that, and uh, uh, I'll show you here uh, uh, our time travel debugger. Other time travel debuggers are available, um, and we can run. So we can run this. So it deliberately looks very like oh, I didn't have done what debug information. Like, do can't fix that problem yet. Right. So. Uh, deliberately looks very like GDB. Actually, this is the GDB front end. Um, and so I can run this, I can continue this. Um, uh, well, actually, let's put, let's not run anything, so I'll get annoying. Let's run it to where the result is, and I can have a look at the results. And I, I might want to see, like, well, how did that change over time? I can do the same thing again, except it works properly. I don't have to do the um, disabling hard, uh, hardware watch points. So watch, that's just a result, and I can see how this gets, uh, it's kind of changed over time. And so here we are, it being updated in uh, thread two, reverse continue again, and now here it is being updated in thread three. And I can see what my, I can see exactly what my program did. I've got one more demo that I'd quite like to show, but I'm conscious of time. How are we, like, set? I, mean, I can run through it in five minutes. Well, I can just find the damn thing, but uh, just give me one second because it's. Uh, where's it gone? Uh, this is the one. Yeah. So uh, this has a. This is probably not the best way to hang on a second. I've just forgotten where to start. This is all fallen out of my, my yeah, 2491. All right, so if I, uh, sorry, our build systems, just uh, talk among yourselves just for one moment. Uh, where's my, oh, okay. So I've got a, I've got a test case here that shows the bug, but I, yeah, I should have, uh, I didn't quite prepare for this, but just let this run just one moment. Uh, let's just, like better ways to do this, but oh, no, now it has to go build the whole product. So it won't take long. Takes a long time when you stood up here waiting for it to complete, I tell you.
So close. Like, uh, need what, sorry? Swords. You need oh, yeah, we do need that. We that's, that's what we should, yes. Yeah, I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't. Well, obviously, I'm completely unprepared because I shouldn't have had to do this, so I didn't bring the swords either. But, uh, right, okay, so this is all good. good. So that's, uh, let me find, oh, this is, that was a really long way to build the executable that I wanted to build, but kind of does the job. Um, so, yeah, so here's my, here's my program right here. So if I run this program, yes, well, actually multiple assertions, one or more assertions fail every time. I can already see it's clearly non-deterministic. Um, and um, but I've been a good boy and put my assertion in, so at least I've got something kind of to go on. Uh, let's uh, well, let's let's run this in. We're going to run this through the thing called a live recorder, which is a separate kind of headless thing that takes a recording of the program, generates a recording, which is much like a core file but does have history information. It's kind of, this is a kind of workflow that's quite similar to um, RR. Anybody used RR? Oh wow, not many people. One, just one, two, three. Yeah. So, so, so RR is kind of like is essentially open source equivalent of uh, of what we do, and uh, it's 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 pretty good. And what it, it's much better than the GDB. Um, it's, it performs much better than the inbuilt GDB recording, and yeah, you can't. The problem is you can't run it everywhere. So, like, it doesn't work in multi-tenant cloud and. Um, uh, various other constraints, shared memory and stuff like that. But if it will run on your program and in your system, like you should definitely be using it. Um, uh, I'm going I'm to run live record, which is, uh, yes, similar, similar kind of concept. So I'm going to run that same uh, thing inside live record. Now that's generated a recording and a core dump. Uh, so that's the core dump, H1 megabytes. That's the recording. Now these are compressed, so they come out much smaller, but um, and it's got the history, and I can load that up. Actually, I'm going to try and I'm going to be really brave now and try and load this up into VS Code. I think that will give us a bit more. It's just like a bit more visual. Uh, make it a bit bigger. All right. Hopefully that doesn't matter. Light theme. Sorry. Light theme. Oh uh, yes. Can anyone tell me how to do that? I can't remember. The, uh, anyone? Command. Sorry, say again. Command or meta AT. KT. Yeah, put it in, um, you know, oh. Control K, Control T. Yeah, that's not doing it. Yeah, it is in here. Some. I mean, it's like hang on. Really, let's come on. How hard can it be? Reference. What's control, control T? I'm sure I typed that. Anyway, right, so dark mode. Like that? Oh, now we're never going to get to sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I am going to load up that recording uh, and then so it's going to ask me to load up there it is uh, so uh, uh, that was called that was called test here we are here's the at least one of the recordings so I load this. So this test, this is a recording that I generated just now, but it could have been generated, you know, a week ago. It could have come out of my test system. It could have been sent to me from production. It could have been sent from a customer who doesn't, who, um, you know, these things are, they're portable as well, right? So it could be, yeah, it could be sent from an end user running on a different system. And I can load this up. And here I am at the assertion of failure. And, uh, I can see here I've got a bunch of threads. This is thread number three. Actually, it's deep inside libc, so it's called assert. Assert then calls a whole bunch of these functions before finally killing the program with a uh, with a sig abort. So I'm going to step back. It's okay. We've recorded. There's no source code on this on this machine for libc, but that's okay. It doesn't need source code. It's just helpful if it's there. So let's reverse step out. So let's unwind the stack 
out of the C library into our code. Right, so here we are. So it's, okay, let's see what's going on. So it's, a squ it's asserted because square root cache is zero and it should be 15. And uh, I can see what's come from this function cache calculate. It's passed in 255. Looks like it should be returning the square root and it's not returned the square root. It's returned zero. Zero is not the square root 255. Now, I could do all of this with the core file as long as I hadn't smashed the stack, right? Because it's kind of a snapshot of the program state at the end. But it doesn't tell me what I need to know, which is why did cache calculate return the wrong thing, right? That information, if I didn't have a recording, that information is gone from the universe, right? But I've got everything here. I've got every line of code that executed. So let's just step back. So this is kind of the first bit of magic. So we're going to go back in time. Now, this is just after cache calculate returns. So let's step back into cache calculate and see why it did what it did. Okay, it's returning. I've got a cache hit. So that's never a good sign, is it? Um, returning, like, I can actually type. So we did add a CLI here, which is which I like. So I can look in here. So it's ret is zero. So that's what we were seeing. Uh, there's a mutex unlock. Maybe this is some kind of threading problem. Let's go back to before the mutex was unlocked. Um, and uh, Where's it going? Ret? Oh, Ret's coming from this gcache i to square root. So I've, I can look at that here. So I can see not just the lines of code that are executed, but all the data all the time. So the i entering the cache tells me that square root of 255 is zero, which clearly is nonsense. Uh, and I need to know why. And I don't know at this point, like, is it a pointer error, a threading error, a logic error? All I know is somebody stomped on that element in my data structure. Um, and I want to find out why. So what we can do here, which is this is a, a super cool kind of killer feature. Whoops, I've got too much info. But if I select that, and then I hit this button here, this is going to go back to the line of code when that was most recently updated. So yeah, that's my expression. OK, so we've gone back in. There's a timeline here. We're still kind of at the end. But we've gone back in time to, well, actually midway through the update here. So let's just close that window. It's a bit in the way. So if I go back one more line. So here, look, the data structure contains good data. The square root of 40 with integers is 6. And so this is the badness happening right here. So watch the, watch the data as I step forwards. And, and this is a like action replay if you're watching sports on the TV, right? Step, step. That's it. That's the corruption happening right there. So we're getting very close now. So what's going on? We're writing number adjacent. Uh, ooh, which is negative one, and so its square root is garbage. Well, uh, huh, well, why is that happening? Why am I getting the square root of minus one? Now it's getting quite easy. I'm getting close to the source. I could probably do this with code inspection, but as this is a demo, let's just uh, let's keep going. So number is uh, zero, and number adjacent is uh, negative. Why is that? Well, let's do the same thing again. Let's just go to when that was set. And uh, okay, it's being set here, and this is the beginning of the loop, and so it's being initialized to number minus one. So here's my bug. Uh, I called cache calculate to get the square root of zero. It did the right, well, it returned the right value, it returned zero, but it's trying to be clever and populate entries either side in the cache, assuming there's some kind of locality of reference, and it populated the square roots of zero and one and negative one. And then my program carried on running for some time and eventually tripped over that bad entry in the cache. That is not going to show up in Valgrind or address sanitizer or anything else. That's perfectly legal C code, right? It's just wrong. Um, and it's, and it's, I'll notice we're in another thread here. We're in, we've switched into thread four. So I've seen what each thread is doing. I can navigate around time. I can switch between the threads. And um, uh, obviously this is a small enough, you know, this is like a hundred lines of code. So you could probably just stare at it. But if you've got a million or 10 million lines of code, or I believe some people in the audience here work on code bases that have 100 plus million lines of code in total. No one knows what all that stuff does, right? And the think about it really hard method is great when you own all of the code. But that so often isn't the case, right? And especially in these big complex code bases, no one individual has all of the code in their head. And very often you're working on something where you have pretty close to zero of the code in your head and you need to understand what the hell is going on and there, I think, time travel, whether you're using 
our stuff at Undo, whether you're using the open source stuff like RR, if you're on Windows, you can use the Microsoft time travel debugging platform. Like, you know, what else being equal, I prefer you to use our stuff, but actually, I just want you to be using time travel because it is just super useful and it, for all kinds. So I might sometimes say, well, if it's a memory problem, might run it through address sanitizer or Hellgrind first, and then only if that doesn't give me the answer, fire up the old time travel. But actually these days, I just go straight to time travel because I'm just gonna, I can still get the answer just as easily, pretty much just as easily. And I don't know, no, I'm not gonna have to try different approaches, right? It's just always there. But uh, so that's kind of my evangelism spiel on that. I think I'll, I've gone on a bit longer than I should have. So I'll wrap there. Thank you very much for listening. We've got time for one or two quick questions. Yeah, we've got time for some questions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Mike Ronnie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for interesting stuff. Uh, how much slower it will be in production to run it with recording? Right, yeah. So uh, it's going to, there is a very real measurable slowdown. It's kind of like the sanitizers. It's going to run, say, half speed. It might be slower, it might be faster. It's going to be half speed per thread as well. So that's going to compound. So you don't really, so the point of these time travel debuggers, for the most part, mostly, you don't turn them on in production and leave them on just in case. That would be lovely. Maybe one day we'll get there. Maybe one day we'll have sufficient kind of support in the CPU and the operating system to make that feasible. But today, you turn them on when you need them. But they're dynamic, right? And so you can turn it on you know, when something's weird and then turn it off again, capture it just once, and then, and then, you've, and then you've got it. But yeah, that is kind of like if there's an Achilles heel, it's, it's you have to recapture the bug once inside the recording. But once you've done that, it's almost always trivial. Yeah. Okay. First question, can you record only part of your program? For example, you enter function, you start recording, you exit function, you stop uh, um, recording. So uh, it depends on the time travel implementation, but uh, most of the good ones know they're process based. It has to be the whole process. Mm -hmm. The reason why it sounds weird that I say the good ones don't do it is so you can do that with say the GDB process record, right? Which is doing this really crummy thing of like single step, see what changed, single step, see what changed. So you can turn that off and on without lots of overhead and um, it doesn't make a huge difference. What our staff and, and RR and, uh, and um, things like replay.io, if you know that, what they do is to, um, like essentially, so just to get into the details a bit, so this, this is a hard problem. Like we are by no means the first people to say, oh, wouldn't it be cool if the debugger would step backwards, right? Um, uh, uh, and it, but it's hard to do because the program's doing billions of things every second, and it's just this huge amount of state. Even if all you're doing is changing the delta, like what changes each instruction, that's still going to be gigabytes and gigabytes of data every second, right? And, uh, and, and also run extremely slowly. So what, what we do is, when I'm stepping back in the demo here, what's happening under the hood is it's going back to a snapshot and playing that forward to like just before where we were, right? And there's enough kind of magic to make sure that that replay from the snapshot does exactly the same thing right down to the threading and everything that the original run did, it, does, it makes it completely deterministic. And, and that's done at kind of the process boundary layer. So you can turn it off and on at will, at least our, our stuff you can, but it kind of defeats the whole point of that, right? Because what we're doing is we're recomputing prior state by going back to a snapshot and playing that forward. And we turn it off and then we turn it on again. We have to take another full snapshot mm -hmm. and, and full state change from that point and then be um, recording that. So it's sort of like, you can, but it, it doesn't actually help you in the way that you think it would. Where it is very useful is in being able to turn it on you know, dynamically, like the system's going weird, right? I'm gonna turn it on for a bit, for a few seconds, capture maybe minutes or hours, whatever, capture what I need and then turn it off again. That's very useful, but the kind of justice function doesn't tend to work so well. And second question about size of snapshots. For yeah. example, if you have a large program that uses one gigabyte of RAM, uh, maybe doing forks, uh, yeah. how, how big is those snapshots? So, so like way smaller than you might think is the good news. So it's done using uh, copy on write, actually it's built on top of the fork mechanism in the kernel. So the snapshots are all copy on write. So 
Uh, it depends a lot on your workload, but the rule of thumb is you need 2x, the rule of thumb is you need 2x the memory and 2x the time. And like, it'll, you know, your mileage will vary, but that's kind of what you should be thinking. So if your program has, you know, one gigabyte of working set, you need another gigabyte to play with to get an effective recording. So questions about kind of the granularity and time of the captures. So if I have uh, many threads, they're kind of interleaving instructions. What's the danger that something gets caught, right? Because there, at some point there has to be these are snapshots. So at some, in some sense, you might miss oh, like an interleaved. No, so the, yeah, so the, like, like now I see the snapshots are really just an optimization for the user experience. The snapshots are just there so that when I do a reverse step in the in the UI, it's nice and quick. Um, you can actually get rid of the snapshots entirely, and it would still work. I just have the starting state, and then I record just the non-deterministic inputs to the program. So you know any system calls and thread switches and signals and shared memory accesses and things like that. But most of the most of the things the program does is actually deterministic. So um, no, it's full visibility. There's zero chance that the bit you're interested in, like somehow, isn't there in the in the recording. Every single it's not, it's not that we've recorded every single instruction because that would be far too big and slow, but we can reconstruct any instruction that executed for the full state. Now, there is the Heisenberg problem, right? When you turn on recording, sometimes, especially when it's a race condition, it just goes away, right? Um, now, there's things we have to uh, make that less of a problem. So we've got a thing called thread fuzzing, which will like, deliberately pause threads and schedule threads at uh, what looks like interesting times, and that's pretty effective. Um, and I would say very unscientific, 80, 90% of the time, at least with thread fuzzing, you can capture the race conditions. Um, at least half the time, the race conditions become more likely, because what you've done, you're slowing down the program that you're recording, which is the same as speeding up the rest of the world, and actually makes them uh, sometimes more likely. But there's no getting away from it. Sometimes, I don't know, one in 10, two in 10, whatever, how hard, how hard you try, you just can't capture that race condition in a recording, and like that just that's really frustrating and it sucks. But we try and make that as you know. But at least it's good the other ninety percent of the time. So, is there a versioning issue with you know you were talking about taking a recording in production and then yeah. debugging it on your development machine? Do they have to have the same glibc or? No, nope, uh, no. Nope, the the recording is entirely self-contained. So. Uh, you know, whatever binaries are running in, in, in production, they're captured in the recording. We will also even capture in the recordings debug info if we can find it. That's the only time there is kind of potentially a versioning issue. If there isn't debug info in the production environment, then not what we, that we can find, it doesn't end up in the, in, the, um, in the recording. And then when you load it up, you have to point it at the right version of the debug info and the right version of the source code as well, of course. So then we do have some stuff to like manage that. Um, so uh, debug info and recording kind of uh, repository management that can make that a lot easier. But so, but but it's, that's all the kind of the stuff that lets you do the source level debugging of the view that can be messed up if the versions are wrong. But everything you need to run it is like self-contained in that recording. Hi, um, I was wondering if there's support for. Uh, multi-process setting with like inter-communication, inter-process communication? Yeah, yeah, so we have, um, so this is, now this isn't in our C++ version yet, this is in our Java version and it's coming to the C++ version and there's something we call step across. So you can like, as you step through the debugger, you can step across an RPC call into the other service. It's, it's yeah, it's super cool. It's not yet in the C++ product, but, but you can kind of, you can, you can lash that together by hand reasonably easily, yeah. We also have a thing, multi-process correlation, if you have shared memory and you have multi-processes um, that, yeah, they're communicating over shared memory or they've just got, you know, shared data structures. Um, so we can record all of those processes and then um, kind of do that same, that last command I was showing you going back to where things change, you can do that across multiple processes, which, yeah, because those, are, those, I mean, multi-process systems with shared memory and one process corrupts the memory and the other process falls over, those are horrible to, to debug normally, right? So yeah, we have good support for that. Uh, we could do one more if anyone has a question. 
I'm loving all the undecentric questions, but but this is not supposed to be a product pitch. So maybe we could do a question <laughs> that's like not about uh, not about our stuff. There's one down here. All right. Um, one of the tools. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a, a tool that they have that's not really uh, superseded by the sanitizers. It's uh, massive. And yeah. it's, it's for memory profiling. So if you have a situation where your program is using more memory than you expect, it will tell you which parts of the code are allocating you know, that memory. Yeah. Um, and I've just uh, found that really useful. I don't really have a question about No, but thank you very much for that contribution because yeah, I, I really like it when there's this kind of yeah, multi-thing. It's not something I've used, but it does look really interesting, and uh, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that, that yeah, you've used it, uh, you found it, you found it useful. And yeah, and interesting. There's no equivalent in the in the in the sanitizers. Yeah, and also I think uh, cash grind as well. I don't think there's a sanitizer equivalent for that. Yeah, I don't uh, think so either. yeah, yeah. So that's because um, um, it's because because the way the Valgrind works, this thing is binary translation. It can do things. So the sanitizers can know things that Valgrin doesn't know because they kind of are part of the compiler, but Valgrin can know things that the sanitizers don't know, which is, you know, like where do things actually live in memory when, and, and how do, you know, cache lines, you know, behave and all of that. So, so yeah, they're not, there's a kind of a lot of overlap, but they are, they do have separate capabilities. Yeah. There's one more question, at the, there's two more questions at the back actually. Maybe just shout. So this might actually be a long answer. Um when you actually the extensive of operating system hardware having talking to the system in the past. Yeah. What are those features? Um so there's a really cool piece of research. Well, the kind of Intel research a few years ago that annoyingly Intel have not decided to productize at least yet, which was so turns out that a lot of the complex logic that you need to make multiprocessor, you know, SMP cache coherent systems work, you can just add a little bit to that and get lots of detailed information about what ordering. Uh, different CPUs were accessing the shared memory. And then from that, you can reconstruct stuff and then you can like go at a uh, batch faster pace. So um, yeah, it's it's frustrating that uh, the, the powers that be at Intel have decided not to. Actually, if you'll allow me just to go on a very quick rant here. This is like, again, uh, the, so like the amount of energy that goes into making the compiler generate code like that little bit faster, some, opt some micro optimization to make the thing just go, you know, past this benchmark slightly quicker. Versus the amount of energy that goes into having the compilers generate proper debug info, right? It's like, I don't know, 100 to 1, right? And the impact to society, to, you know, the productivity on all the programmers in all the world coping with like not very good debug info compared to the impact of the code being generated running that little bit faster, it's probably 100 to 1 the other way around. Right, but we just don't put, like as an industry, we just don't put the investment in to making the code be debuggable. And it's just doesn't make, it's just nuts. Like the economies, you know, the, the economics of it just make no sense whatsoever. The compiler vendors, you know, the compiler writers all, if the debug info is wrong, they don't even really consider it a compiler bug. Like if I generate wrong code, that's definitely a bug, and we're not going to allow, you know, we fix that. Generates wrong, wrong debug info, uh, oh well, yeah, we'll fix it next time. It's like, it's, yeah, <laughs> but it doesn't need to, it doesn't need to be that way. Yeah, and, the, and so the CPU vendors could also, you know, play, uh, play their bit, but then I guess, you know, they do what they figure people are going to pay money for, so. Did we have one more? All right, last one. Um, did you see, sorry, uh, did you see any improvement due to uh, fork with on-demand uh, copy on write or things like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, build, so, so building the snapshots on top of fork so we get the, the copy on write uh, behavior is, is a huge win, yeah. I mean, it, how much the win will depend a little bit on what the workload is doing. If, it, if it's like touching every word in memory 
in some big loop, then you know less so because they all get cowed in. Uh, but but actually, we have customers who do exactly that. We do, we, we do a lot of work with like the EDA vendor people who have simulators that do exactly that pattern of workload, and it works works really well there. So yeah, cow is just it, well, I mean, copy and write is one of the coolest OS features, right? Uh, do you know when it's going to be included into the main mainstream kernel? Uh, you mean the recording? The recording? The functionality? The updated fork. There is a, a new version of fork with the copy on white uh, of the page table. So it can do in a microsecond uh, fork instead of milliseconds. Oh, I it, it mean, it copy, it does copy out the page tables as well as the pages? Yes. Oh, okay. I see. I see. I didn't know about that. Okay. No, that sounds uh, useful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we get that soon. Yeah. All right, we're going to call it there for the Q&A. Greg, thanks so much for, uh, for this talk. It was really awesome. Thank you. Uh, can you pivot back to the slides? Slides, yeah. Uh, that's not slides. That's slides. Cool. And uh, just the last slide that oh, yeah. we appended on here. Uh, so, yeah, I know some of you were just here uh, just with us last week, and I'm just humbled that you showed up for a second week in a row. Thanks again for coming out, uh, hang out with us, and hear another awesome talk. Uh, QR code is a link to our website, and if you find yourself coming month after month, you want to throw us $5 a month or something, or even a one-time donation, we really appreciate it. It helps us keep going what we're doing here. So uh, anyway, thanks to everyone for coming out. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>